Well, it is great to be with you this morning uh, on the Lord's Day to gather with God's people to worship, to hear from the Word. Let me uh, open our time in a word of prayer. God, we uh, come to you in need of your strength, of your grace. Uh, We just thank you that we can come to you in prayer, that we have access to your throne through the blood of Christ. So we just, uh, we thank you again that we can come and worship that you have transformed us, that you have made us alive in Christ, so that we can, in the heart, be worshipers of you. I pray that we would worship as we hear your word, as we sing truth, as we fellowship with one another, uh, that you would, through your spirit, uh, just encourage, strengthen us this morning, so that we could be just more sharpened tools in your hand. Uh, We love you, Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen. All right, well, you can open your Bibles back up to uh, Proverbs 31, Proverbs 31. This is uh, part three, just a little mini-series on, uh, on Proverbs 31, this picture of a godly woman. It's been just a, a joy to work through this passage together the last several weeks, and my hope is just to, to help uh, etch in your mind and your heart uh, what God says about uh, just a biblical femininity, a biblical character, godly character in a woman that pleases the Lord, so that we can, uh, as a church, encourage the, the women in this church toward this kind of character, and so that the ladies in this room can go after this kind of character. And you see in Proverbs 31, this, this picture of godliness through this, this woman, and, and you know how Proverbs works, you have these word pictures uh, these truisms, and we get to see these, uh, this, these truisms, this picture through uh, the life, really the life of a woman. We get, we get to see her, her activities, how she lives, how she works, how she interacts with her family, uh, the kind of work that she does, her labor, uh, her sewing, planting, selling, all these things, all these activities, but behind all of the activities, what we're looking at is her character, uh, what drives her and motivates her in all these things. And I love just different places in Scripture where you just get these clear pictures uh, of godliness. Think about 1 Timothy chapter 3. You have the elder and deacon qualifications. You just get a list. This is what godly character looks like. Well, here in Proverbs 31, we have really a a picture, a list. This is godly character, but not in uh, statements. Obviously, in a a word picture, uh, we can see all these different activities, and you can really turn these things over in your mind. This is why Proverbs is so helpful. You can look at this, you know, contemplate, what, is it, what are the implications of this on my life? What does it look like for me to work with diligence, with delight, in the way that this woman works? And uh, as you read this proverb, you just see that really every area of life, maybe every, you could say every crevice of your heart, uh, is going to be impacted. You know, there's no place that's off limits. You see it uh, in the way that she interacts in the home, in the way that she interacts with others, in the way that she serves, in the way that she spends her money, in the way that she spends her time, you know, in what her thought life is like. I mean, all of these areas are, are in view here. I like to think about uh, Scripture as a, uh, really as a plumb line. You think about something like this, you see godly character as a, you think of a plumb line when you're building a house. If you've ever been in, involved in construction, you see a plumb line this line to, to pour the foundation of a house to see if it's level. So you think about just a, a plumb line of Scripture here, and you get to measure your own life against it. And you get to see just the, the inconsistencies, the, the rough edges, the areas that, that the Lord still needs to sanctify and refine as you look at this picture of godliness. So this is just uh, so helpful for us. You'll, you're you're going to see some, I'm sure, some, some ugly things in your own heart, things that have to go as you look at this picture. And just a great opportunity to confess those to the Lord and then put on these, these characteristics. And what's so, so great about Scripture is that as the Lord gives us commands, the Lord does not give us commands that, that He doesn't also empower us to keep. You know, if you have the, the Holy Spirit, if you are alive in Christ, then you actually have the ability to obey. He has actually given us a divine enablement, His power, His Spirit to actually empower us toward obedience. So as you look at these commands, to know that this is what the Spirit wants to produce, this character, this is what the Spirit wants to produce in the, in the minds and hearts of women who are His, His children. So we're going to look at this morning, uh, really I'm going to start by looking at, kind of zooming out of this, 
of this passage and looking at characteristics of this woman. Uh, we, we basically stopped last week at the end of verse 27, and 28 through 31 is a, a summary of her life. I'm going to get there at the end of our time, so we'll get to the end. We'll get to the summary statements in verse 28. But I actually want to just stop and kind of zoom out and look at the, the characteristics of her life. We kind of worked through the passage, and I, I looked at a lot of different things, a lot of different aspects of her life, but I want to summarize I think it's helpful just to, to summarize these things and say these are the, the characteristics. Kind of synthesize the truths here so that you can have, just, just to lay out, things that you can start to, to pray toward, you can start to, to go after, start to encourage others toward. So we're going to look at here 10 characteristics of a, of a woman who fears the Lord, the, the God-fearing woman in Proverbs 31. And the, the overarching characteristic, we, we'll start at the end where we started the last several times. Proverbs 31 verse 30. This is the overarching characteristic of her life, is she is a woman who fears the Lord. That is, that is who she is. She is a God-fearer. This Old Testament expression of saving faith. In the New Testament, you can think of different words, a, a Christian, a follower of Christ, someone who has repented and believed. Well, the Old Testament, one who fears the Lord, that is a, a statement of someone who has a right relationship with God, who has, who has repented and believed, who has saving faith. They are a God-fearer. They see God as, as creator, as judge, and they also see him as a savior, as a saving God. Uh, I think about reading through Psalm, Psalm 51 this week, David's uh, Psalm of Repentance. And there, he makes a statement in Psalm 51 where, where he says that God is, is justified. He says, you are justified when you judge. That is to say, I, I deserve your judgment. I agree with you, God, that I deserve judgment. And at the same time, to say, God, you are a God of loving kindness, and you love to forgive sinners. I mean, this is the, the heart attitude of a God-fearer. God, you are just to judge, and you love to show loving kindness. And I have submitted to you in faith. So th- this is who this woman is. She is a, a God-fearer. She has been reconciled to God, and now she wants to please him. So living all of her life, uh, in the, you could say, in the presence of God, under his authority, so here, as, as we work through, just to, again to summarize, uh, verses 11 through 27, just the, the characteristics of this woman's life. And well, first, uh, verse 11, you, you see just the, this statement, the heart of her husband trusts in her. I think it's such a significant statement. Uh, so number one, uh, she is trustworthy, trustworthy. You talk about trust, you know, a husband to trust his wife. You talk about trust in the Lord. When you say someone trusts in the Lord, uh, we're saying that they have confidence in his character. They have confidence in who he is, that, that he is who he says he is. We'll, we'll trust in a person similar. His, his, the husband trusts in his wife. He is confident in her character. He is confident in who she is. Uh, she has been faithful. And this is his, his gut instinct, his gut reaction, his impulse. It says his heart trusts in her. His reaction is just to trust her. And it's a pretty incredible statement you think about just to, to have a heart reaction to say, I, I implicitly trust you in all these ways. And as you read through this proverb, uh, you see why he trusts her. I mean, all the things that she has done. She, she doesn't slack. She doesn't cut corners. She's faithful. Uh, she uses all her resources for the best of her household. She's proactive. She takes care of the needs of others. She's reliable. She's stable. She's frugal. I mean, all of these characteristics so he trusts in her because she is trustworthy. And that is just uh, really foundational for any relationship, right? If you don't have a trust, if you don't have mutual trust, you don't really have a relationship. You know, you've heard the statement, I trust you as far as I can throw you. I don't know if you've heard that. You know, basically, as long as I can see you, I trust you. Well, here, this is a, a trust that says, when I, when I don't see you, I trust you. When I don't know what you're doing, I, I, I actually trust you because I have such confidence in your character. We say to our kids a lot of times, you know, different uh, mindset of if you're faithful in little things, you can be faithful in greater things. Show responsibility, self-responsibility in this thing, and and you can have more responsibility. Well, here she has shown so much uh, responsibility, so much faithfulness, that there is just a complete trust in her character. And on the flip side, you could just, uh, you could think about all of the ways you could betray trust. You know, I think it's helpful to look at it from the flip side, uh, just to consider maybe what she's done to earn this trust, how you could lose this trust. Obviously, in a marriage, any kind of betrayal, infidelity would, would destroy trust. 
Uh, even just something simple, though, just not doing what you say you're going to do, not, not following through on commitments would destroy trust. Uh, if there's no confidence that she's actually going to follow through, she's actually going to do her work, well, clearly that's, that's not the case here. You know, if you're hiding things, if you're, if you're uh, not vulnerable, if you're not admitting to wrongs or, or never confessing sin, you know, that would destroy trust. If you make poor decisions over and over again, if you can't handle hard decisions, if you, if you crack under pressure, you know, that would, that would destroy some trust. Uh, if you hide things, or even just the uh, poor spending habits, you know, I, I can't trust you with resources. But you see, in all of these things, he trusts in her. So there's a, just an assumption here of, of communication, of, of integrity, that she has a follow-through. And this is just, a, from a marriage standpoint, it's helpful just to kind of assess your own marriage to say, how are we doing? Are, are we trustworthy to each other? Have I, have I endeared trust in my spouse? Am I doing anything that actually uh, undermines trust? Or am I building trust? <clears throat> if you just were to think about maybe the, the strongest marriage that, that you know of, just think about a couple in your mind. I'm sure we could all think of a couple or two and think, you know, what's the, the strongest marriage? What, what makes that a strong marriage? What is it about them that makes for such a strong marriage? You know, it's not going to be just as something as simple as like, oh, they have fun together or they like each other. I think this statement would capture, if you were going to boil down, what is it? Oh, they, they trust each other. The heart of her husband trusts in her. And she, verse 12, she does him good and not evil all the days of her life. I mean, that, that kind of relationship, uh, a mutual trust, doing him only good all the days of his life. And that's helpful not just for a marriage, but for all of us to consider, married or not married, to say, am I living in such a way that I'm, I'm trustworthy, I can be trusted, that, I, that I'm faithful, that I'm living a life of integrity when no one sees. You know, the people closest to me that know me the, the best, they trust me implicitly. So she is, number one, she is trustworthy. And as you, as you watch this woman's life, as you keep reading verses 13 onward, I think the, the characteristic that comes up over and over again, what, what marks her life, is really her work ethic, just how hard she works. And that's the, the second point, is, is she is diligent, diligent. She is a, a hard worker. Everything that she does, over and over again, you see her hands, verse 13. She works with her hands. Verse 19, she stretches out her hands. Verse 20, she extends her hands. Her, her hands are in view over and over again because she is working. Uh, she, she labors diligently. She, she won't get sucked into a, just a lazy lifestyle. You think about the culture we're in, especially, I think, Arizona. So many people talk about moving to Arizona because of, because of the climate, because of the lifestyle, because of the you know, outdoor recreation. People come here because they don't want to work hard, because they want to relax. Right? And she is just not going to be sucked into a, a lifestyle of relaxation. She is, she is diligent. She's a hard worker. Verse 13, it says she looks for wool and flax. That is, a, she is proactively looking for materials. These are materials for sewing. So she's actually going out of her way to say, I want to I look for materials. I want to be proactive. Uh, she's taking initiative here. She doesn't have to be told what to do. She's, she's getting after it. That's what her diligence looks like. Verse 13, uh, it says she works with her own hands. You know, she makes this clothing herself. She, she's able to, to, to get dirty, to, to work hard. Uh, verse 14, it says that she is like a merchant ship. This merchant ship going on a, a long journey, uh, going on a far journey to, to get food for her household, willing to, to go the extra mile, not slacking off. There's a, a frugality in view there, but also just a diligence. There's no, no slack in her work. Uh, verse 15, it says, she rises. <clears throat> she rises while it is still night. So she gets up early. She's not, a, not afraid to get up early to, to make sure that she, she does her work, make sure that she gets the, the job done well. In verse 18, it says, on the flip side, she senses that her gain is good and her lamp does not go out at night. So she's willing to stay up late. And again, we shouldn't read this, I think, as just a, a day in the life of this woman. I think it's seasons of time you know, periods of time. This is a characteristic of her life. So there are seasons where she has to rise early. There are seasons where she has to stay up late. 
but she is, uh, she's willing to go the extra mile uh, because of just her diligent work ethic. Uh, verse 19, you see uh, just manual labor. She stretches out her hands to the distaff, and this is a, a sewing loom, and her hands grasp the, sp- the spindle. So here, what's in view is her sewing, you know, with her own hands, working hard. Uh, she's willing to, to master this craft. And you see as she's sewing, that she, it goes on to say that she, verse 24, she's making linen garments and sells them to tradesmen. That she's actually mastered this craft. She's worked really hard over years and seasons of time to be an expert at this. And just consider what that would take. I, I was listening to uh, this basketball uh, podcast uh, about these two guys that are shooting, about uh, shooting guards, some of the best shooters in the NBA. They were just talking about their their work ethic. How do you be the best shooter in the NBA? And the one guy said, well, every single day I take 340 shots. 340 shots. And he goes through every spot in the court, you know, 20 shots at each of these spots, you know, and it's just a, a perfect arc, perfect uh, form, you know, to, just to capture. I want to have the best shooting form, to be the best shooter in the league. And I just thought about that, to just really to master your craft, to have that kind of work ethic. You know, what does it take to be so good at something that you've done it over and over and over again? Well, here, she is, she is so good at this. She is working hard, so good that she can sell it to the, the traders. She, she makes the finest linens because she has mastered her craft. She doesn't take days off. You know, every time she puts her hand to this, she follows it all the way through. So this is just a, a life of diligence, a life of self-discipline, uh, a life, a discipline, a trim, bla- trim back life. You know, she's willing to go the extra mile. She's willing to get up early. Uh, she's not coasting. You know, she says no. It says in verse 27 that she does not eat the bread of idleness. Eat the bread of idleness. That is to say she doesn't enjoy, uh, she doesn't enjoy being lazy. She's not, she's not fulfilled by laziness, by idleness. She says no to it. Yeah, she's not feeding that, that fleshly comfort. I think about Proverbs 6, the, the sluggard. You have in Proverbs 6 kind of this like siren song of the sluggard. You know, a little sleep, a little slumber, just a little bit more. And it says she doesn't enjoy that. She won't eat that bread. If you were to ask uh, an employer, you know, what's, what's one thing you're looking for in an employee, especially at maybe an entry-level position? I think what you'd find, most people say, and I've heard, I've heard this, is, well, they have to work hard. They have to be able to learn, and they have to be able to work. Right? They have to have the humility to be taught, and they have to work hard. I think the same thing in, in relationships. You're going to ask, you know, a young man's asking, what should I look for in a, in a woman? Well, is she a worker? Is she diligent? Is she willing to work? And does she have the humility to learn? The same for young men. Does he work hard and, and is he teachable? And you, you see these characteristics on display in this woman. She is diligent. And we're going to see later, she is, she is humble. She is teachable. But in, in all this work, you could imagine being so busy working so hard and just putting your head down and just being self-focused, uh, just being consumed with, okay, I got to get this done and I got to get this done and I got to get this done. But, but you see, she is, uh, she's focused on others. And, and also what you see is, you see a, a gratefulness. She takes joy in her work. Uh, that's the, the third point here. She is grateful. Look at verse 13. As she's looking for wool and flax, it says she works with her hands in delight. There's a, an enjoyment. There's a joy that she finds in her work. She is a, able to be thankful in it. I think that, that phrase, she works in delight, is, I think can be pretty indicting as you think about it. It's, it's one thing to work hard. It's one thing to say, here's all the stuff I have to do. Here's my to-do list. Let me make sure I get everything done. It's another thing to say, thank you, Lord, for this work that you've given me. To actually show up at work and be thankful, to be grateful Thank you, Lord, for, for giving me a, a body that can work and hands and feet. Thank you for giving me these abilities and gifts. Thank you for, for giving me skills that I can use for your glory. Just think back to, to Genesis, chapter six, Genesis chapter 1 and, and day 6 of creation. You know, God puts Adam in the garden to, to cultivate and keep the garden. He puts him in the garden to work, gives him responsibility. He says, it is good for you to work. This is a gift from God, and she remembers this. She works with her hands in delight. She, she enjoys her work. In verse 18, it says she senses that her gain is good. Uh, that word senses is, is the same word for taste. You know, she experientially senses. She tastes that her work is good. You know, she finds fulfillment in a job well done. 
Uh, the idea of going to bed tired at night. You know, we've all been there where you, you have a long day at work or maybe you're working outside doing yard work or you have a, a long day uh, at home and just lots of manual labor and you're exhausted at night and you go to bed and there's a, a sense of accomplishment. I worked hard today. She, she enjoys that. There's a, a thankfulness, a gratefulness in that. Uh, if any of you have ever had a job, all of us that have gone to work, you know that this, this takes work to cultivate this kind of attitude. You don't just show up at work on Monday just feeling grateful, right? You don't just, every Monday, it's a, it's a new battle, right? Tomorrow morning to get up and say, thank you, Lord, for the, the week you have in front of me, right? A battle to wrestle to our hearts to the ground, to, to have a, what I'd call a gospel gratefulness. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you for giving me abilities. Thank you for making me part of your family. Now, thank you for giving me these responsibilities I get to step into today. I mean, that is a, a daily habit that she has. She is taking her heart before the Lord uh, to be thankful, to be grateful, to work in delight. <clears throat> Again, this is a woman who fears the Lord, all, all of this under the watchful eye of the Lord. So she is, uh, she is grateful. And that doesn't, you know, not to say that there's not going to be hard days, hard seasons of work, discouragements at home. I mean, all those things are true. But what characterizes her life is gratefulness. And this is not a sinlessness. You know, as you, as you read her life, she's not sinless. But the characteristic of her life here, gratefulness as she works. I remember when I uh, started working at the church a couple years ago, and in my mind, it's like, this is great. I get to work at the church. I get, I get paid, and I get to study the Bible and do all these things that I love to do. And then uh, I remember... Uh, maybe a month in, three in the afternoon, you know, hitting this wall and thinking, oh, wait a minute, that, this is the same issue at my last job. At three in the afternoon, I have to actually push through, work hard. You know, my temptation is to be lazy, to stop working. And I, and I found out pretty quick, it's like, oh, it's not the, the issue isn't the job that I had, right? And I knew that going in, but just to be reminded again, the issue isn't the, the job, the issue is the heart that you bring to it. You know, this daily battle to just to work hard, to be diligent, to be thankful as you work. And in all, all her work, all her labor, I think what's really shocking, uh, verse 15 and, and 20, really verse 20, as she's working, as she's uh, even, verse 19, uh, sewing clothes, her immediate response in verse 20 is that it says, she extends her hands to the poor and she stretches out her hands to the needy. So she's not self-focused as she works. There's a, a generosity. And number four, she is others-focused. Others-focused. She is uh, working for the good of others, eager to step in and give. You know, not just consumed on what's in it for me. And this is so hard. If, you're, if you have ever been busy, you know, you're working hard, you have so many tasks to do, a laundry list of things to get done, so easy to just become self-focused right? Just agenda-driven. This is all about me and, and getting my checklist done today. But she is eager to, to step in and give. The, the second the, the needy person asks, you know, she's considerate. She's thoughtful. She's looking out for the needs of others. The same thing in verse uh, 15. She rises while it's still night, so she's getting up early so that she can give food to her household. You know, she's getting up early, not for herself, but she's giving, uh, getting up early so that she can give so she can take care of, of those around her. She is focused on the needs of those uh, that she's responsible for, her household. Uh, eager, considerate, aware, uh, ready to help. I, I was thinking about Ephesians. Turn real quick to Ephesians. Keep your hand in, in Proverbs. But Ephesians 4, I think it's so helpful as you think about uh, work in, in this, uh, just this generous spirit that she has. I think Ephesians 4 ties these things together so well. Ephesians 4.28, you have this section of, of put off, put on. You know, put off these, these sins. Renew your mind with truth and, and put on right living. And here the, the put off in verse 28. Paul says, He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. So you have a situation, someone who is, who is stealing, and you could even, you could even uh, maybe zoom out a little bit and think, you know, someone who is lazy, stealing from their company, not, not working hard on the clock. You know, but someone who is stealing, there's the, the sinful habit. 
there is a, a pattern that they have in their heart that they need to put off. Sin that they need to confess to the Lord. And what do you put on in its place? And he says to, to put off stealing, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good. So now that you have a, what you put in its place is you put hard work in its place. But look at the motivation in verse 28. So that he will have something to share with one who has need. He's working hard, putting off the, the, the stealing or the laziness, putting on hard work, but with a motivation so that now he can give. You used to be a taker, and now you actually have the resources to bless others. Uh, that's what's in view back in Proverbs 31. This woman who works hard, who is eager to give to others. I mean, that's the, the fuel of her work is others focused. How do I be a blessing to others with my work? And we're, uh, we're making our way through these pretty quick. So again, this is just, uh, just to summarize, kind of synthesize. Here's some characteristics, big picture, for us just to have some things to really to take away as you try to summarize this proverb. There's, you could really summarize these a lot of different ways as you think through the just different angles on these, on these truisms here. But I think it's helpful just to, to give us, here's, here's some characteristics, some overarching characteristics of her life. Uh, number five, prudent. She is prudent. Uh, you can turn to just a couple pages back, Proverbs twenty-seven, twelve. I think helpful just to just to get a quick definition, a quick mindset of what what is prudence. Proverbs twenty-seven, twelve. A prudent man sees evil and hides himself, but the naive proceed and pay the penalty. So prudence here to to assess a situation, to look at uh, the consequences of your decisions and say, there is danger coming. So I'm going I'm to make this decision in light of uh, future consequences. Where the naive, they're not, they're not thinking about decisions. They're not thinking about consequences. They're not thinking that their, their actions have any consequences. They just proceed. They just make whatever decision uh, just off the cuff, on the fly. And it says, and they pay the penalty. There are, are hard mistakes they are going ma- to make. But the prudent, they work hard on the front end as they're making decisions to, to assess you know, with the wisdom principles they have, with the truth of Scripture, uh, advice from those around them to say, what, what is the best decision in the moment? And here, she is prudent. You see uh, her assess her situation, her look forward. What's coming and how do I plan for it? Uh, verse 15, it says that as she rises early at the end of verse 15, she gives portions to her maidens. Uh, portions here, this is uh, not just food, but responsibilities. She gives uh, jobs to her, her maidens, the, the other household workers. So she is divvying up tasks for them. So she's able to assess, you know, what's coming today? What are the things in front of me? How do I delegate these responsibilities to others? So just day by day, she is, she is planning. She is assessing. She is uh, looking at, at her daily life and saying, what's the best way to accomplish this task? But then you have uh, verse 21, more than just day by day, She's, she's actually looking ahead at seasons of time. It says in verse 21, she's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. So here she's looking forward at seasons of time. She says, winter is coming. I know that the snow is coming. My family needs to be clothed in warm clothes. So what does she do? She ahead of time. She prepares ahead of time. And if you, if you read kind of the flow, verse 13, she's looking for wool and flax, these materials to make clothes. Verse 19, she's using her hands to actually make them. And now verse 21, she's not afraid because she's done all this work. So she proactively prepared, got the materials, made the clothes, and now she's prepared for winter ahead of time. And this is prudence to see this is, uh, winter is coming, danger is coming. There's something on the horizon, and she proactively uh, works ahead of time. So you could, uh, you could just think about what, what this would look like just in, in daily life of your, of your family, daily life to just to say, what are the, the needs of the family? What are the needs of, of the people in my life? What are the needs of my children? What are the dangers in front of them? How do I, how do I help prepare them for the future? You know, to have a, a pulse on the family, to know what's coming, to know where everyone's at and what they need. Not just uh, physically, but you could think spiritually, you could think uh, emotionally, all these different aspects of their life. How do I help prepare them for the future? So she's not just uh, making decisions uh, on the fly. She's not just uh, every moment, just, okay, what's, what's next? But she's actually planning in advance. There's a, a thoughtfulness, a diligence, 
you know, you could even say a teachability, a humility to, to start to plan ahead. That, that, takes, uh, that takes humility, right? To say, I don't have all the answers. I actually need help to think about the future. And that's the, that would be the next, uh, really the next characteristic. This woman is, is humble. She is humble. Number six. And what I mean by humble is, is a couple things. That she is not, she's not looking for position. She's not looking for praise. She's not looking for recognition. I mean, you see as you read the end of the psalm, or the end of the proverb here, that she, she is praised. People do recognize her. They praise her. They recognize her character. But that's not what she's doing it for. And verse 23, I think, highlights this. It talks about her husband. It says her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. And why I think that highlights her humility is because it's, it's showing this picture of her husband being publicly recognized. He is the one who is known in the, the gates, the city center. He is an elder. This is uh, the community leader. He's one of the community leaders in the land. So he has this position of, of prominence, of public recognition. And, and you read this, and I think to read it as, and this is a good thing. And she is supportive of this. She has embraced her role and wants him to embrace his role. There's a, a humility there to say, I want to embrace the, the position that God has put me in. I want, to embrace the, I want to embrace the work that God has for me. So she is, she is not uh, railing against, you could say, God's providence to put her in this situation, in this season of life, to support her husband. She is humble herself under the, the mighty hand of God. I mean, that is humility, to say, God, you are God and I am not. And I want to humbly obey. I want to humbly submit under your purposes. I want to humbly follow uh, whatever path you have for me. And you see verse 22, uh, we talked about last time, just this, I think this shocking statement in verse 22, it says her clothing is fine linen and purple. So you find out here, this is clothing of nobility. She actually has a, a noble rank in society. So this woman who is working so hard, who is so diligent, who is willing to work with her own hands out in the field, is, uh, is of a noble class. So again, just the humility on display. She's not saying, I'm, I'm too good for this work. Uh, this is beneath me. No, she, she just embraces whatever the Lord has for her. And again, this is the, the one who fears the Lord. Think about Isaiah 66, verse 2. The one that God looks to is the one who is humble, broken in heart, who trembles at God's word. And this is a God fear. They are, they are humble, characteristically humble. Uh, embracing wherever the Lord has placed them, the, the role that they have. And as you, as you see her position here, I think what's really helpful is just to, to take back from, you know, the, the worldly mindset around us that would say that, you know, this woman who is embracing uh, home life, who is, who is going after her household, verse 27, that she looks after the way of her household, to say that she is not squandering her life, she's not squandering her abilities, she is not just sitting on the sidelines. But number seven, she, she is ambitious. You read throughout this proverb, she is ambitious. She has goals. She is working hard. She is expanding the resources of the household. She has a drive, you could say, a godly ambition. She's not uh, squandering her opportunities. Look at verse 16. It says, she considers a field and buys it. From her earnings, she plants a vineyard. So she is expanding the resources of the, of the, of the household. It's even in, in verse 16. She, she buys the field from the earnings of the field, from the produce of the field. Now she has more earnings, then she plants a vineyard. So you just see this progression, uh, just uh, very goal-centered here. She is driven to, to work hard, to, to grow the, just the resources that she has. Uh, verse 18, she senses that her gain is good. You know, she wants to do more of it. She's eager to, to, to follow through, to keep doing this. Verse 24, she is selling her, her garments to traders, supplying belts to, the, to those that are going to sell them in far, faraway lands. Again, just the ambition here, the, the motivation. So I think it's helpful just to hold kind of both of these truths. She's content, she's humble, she's content in her position. At the same time, she is ambitious. Both of these things are true. She, she doesn't just, uh, she's not used this uh, as an excuse to say, well, I'm just in this position. I'm just going to chill. This is all the Lord has for me. No, she is eager. She is driven to just to maximize whatever the Lord has put in front of her. 
I think about Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.9, just a, a godly ambition. You know, he says, I make it my ambition to please Christ. That, that Christians are an ambitious people. Ambitious because we have one life. Uh, ambitious to, to say, how can I make maximum impact for the Lord while I'm on this earth? And that's what you see in this woman, and just uh, making a maximum impact, you could say. Not, not wasting her time. A maximum usefulness to the Lord. So she is uh, ambitious. Number eight, she is confident. She is confident. Uh, confident, you could think of someone that's, you know, confident in, the, in a self-confident kind of way, you know, holding their, their shoulders high, kind of a strut. I know what I'm doing without uh, really knowing what's going on. But here, there's a, a confidence marked by humility, confidence that because she has submitted under the, the hand of the Lord, she is uh, confident in the Lord. Uh, I love this, these verses, verse 17 and 25, just the, the strength of this woman on display. She is uh, strong. You could say she is confident in the Lord. Verse 17, she girds herself with strength. She makes her arms strong. Similar in verse 25, strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. So there's a, a fortitude that she has, uh, an internal fortitude. She doesn't crack under pressure. Right, you could say a, a meekness, you know, the word meekness, a strength under pressure. That's what she demonstrates because she is confident in the Lord. Uh, not second guessing, not so concerned about what other people think. As the, the proverb goes on, you see verse 30, it talks about charm and, and beauty that we'll look at in a minute. But you think about the difference of someone that's so concerned about how do I look? How do other people uh, value me? What's, what's their perspective of me? Right? And, and someone that's so consumed with those things, a, a fear of man, that's so concerned about what do other people think. But here, what you see in her is a, a strength. You know, not, not bending under the pressures of others. Not going after uh, other people's opinions. But a, a confidence because she is confident in the Lord. You see that in, uh, in the verse 25. She smiles at the future. You know, to stare the, the future, the uncertain future, what the future holds, all the anxieties, all the fears, all the unknowns of the future. You know, you think about the future, what, what's coming? Hardships and trials and uncertainties, all these unknown things, and she stares them down in the face and she smiles on them. She is not fearful of the future. Even she laughs at the future. She has a, just a disposition toward the future that is confident because her strength is in the Lord. Right, there's a, just a, a fortitude because she stands on, on a different kind of foundation. You know, she stands on a foundation of, of truth. She is a, a, a fear of God, trusting his word, able to, to have certainty in the face of an uncertain future. So this is a, a confident woman. Whatever trials and hardships and temptations, whatever other people say about her, she is still confident. Uh, her compass, you could say, her true north found in the Lord. Uh, number nine, she is truth saturated, filled with truth. And I think you see that in verse 25 and 26, especially verse 26. You know, she opens her mouth in wisdom. When she speaks, she speaks truth. I think about Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love. Well, how, how do you speak the truth? We well, have to know the truth. You have to be saturated in the truth. What comes out of her mouth? is truth. Uh, wisdom, the, the application of truth to the situations in life. So it's not just that she knows a lot of facts, but she actually has, has applied those facts, those Bible, Bible truths, to daily living. She's actually worked through, you know, what, is, what does this book say? Not just what does it say, but how does it apply to my situation in life? How does it apply today to this decision? How do I take the truths that I know and, and apply them to this conversation that I'm having? All with the mindset of how do I please the Lord? How do I take all of his truth and walk in wisdom in a way that's pleasing to him? So she is saturated with truth so that when she opens her mouth, what comes out is truth. And sometimes uh, biblical counseling can get a, get a bad, bad rap because people become kind of robotic counselors. You know, someone can be, you know, I'm feeling anxious. And it's like you slam them with a Bible verse. Do not be anxious. You know, or they're unkind, and you just slam them with a Bible verse. Right? But here, wisdom is saying, how do I take these truths? How do I apply them to your situation in life? She's actually teaching wisdom. 
how do I help you to, to navigate life with these same truths? How do I take you by the hand and, and point you to truth and say, hey, this is the, the truth that's going to help you. Let me help you navigate. Let me help you apply this to your life. That is what she does with truth because she is so saturated in her own heart. And the same with, uh, with verse 25. I mean, to be able to, to smile at the future. I mean, she has to, to know God's truth. She has to have confidence. She's confident in God's character because she knows God's word. Right? That is the way to have a confidence about the future is that you have actually saturated your heart. You think about Psalm 1. The, the blessed man who meditates on the law of the Lord day and night. That's, that's who she is. She is the blessed one who is just saturated in God's word to, to be able to face the trials of life. So she, she knows the truth. Uh, lastly, number 10 here. And again, just uh, different ways to summarize. You could capture a lot of different characteristics here. But I think just trying to, trying to zoom out and say, here's the, the basic characteristics that, that kind of come out as you read this, this proverb. Number 10, she is a, a steward you know, stewardship that is in view here. Uh, when I say stewardship, really just a, a way to say she is faithful with what God has entrusted to her. God has entrusted to her all of these, these resources, people, a uh, household, all of these things. As she is growing the resources of the household, you know, I don't think we should read the verses where she is buying and selling and saying what that means is you have to have a, a side business. And if you're not making extra income, something's wrong. I think what's in view there is her stewardship, that she has the resources that she has. She wants to, to use those well and expand those. That everything that God has entrusted to her, she takes seriously. Uh, turn turn to, to Matthew 25. I think it's just such a, such a helpful passage, Matthew 25, just to think about stewardship. Because I think about this passage as I read it, and I think about this woman, you just see that she has, she has lived this passage out taking all the things that the Lord has entrusted to her and saying, how do I maximize those? Uh, Matthew 25, starting in verse 14, this parable of the, the talents. The, the, the Lord gives us this parable really to, to show us this is what faithfulness looks like. This is what it looks like to, to be a, a servant of the king, to be pleasing to the Lord with what he has given you. It says in verse 14, And just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them, to the one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. And he went on his journey. And then it goes on to tell how the, the two expanded the talents, and the one just sat on them, squandered them. And the, in verse, uh, you see in verse 20, the one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you have entrusted five talents to me. See, I've gained five more. His master said, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. I mean, that is the, the mindset here. You go back to Proverbs. Uh, is that she has been entrusted in different, in that, I love in that parable because different types of talents. Not everyone's going to have the same stewardship. You know, here she has a lot of resources. She has a big estate. But the issue isn't how many resources you have. You have in that parable 10, 5, 1. But the, the issue is what do you do with the, the resources, the talents, the gifts, the abilities, the time that you have to maximize those things for the Lord? And you see this, this woman is using all of her time as a, a steward. Is she like a merchant ships, verse 14, bringing her food from afar, willing to go long distance to, to gather bread for her family, a frugality in view, not, uh, not wasteful, uh, thrifty, you could say, willing to go long distances to provide for her family, to bring in the right kind of food. Uh, even in verse 16, it says she considers a field and buys it. This word considers, she's assessing the situation, maybe making a list of pros and cons. Not a, not a quick purchase, not, you know, in a, in a culture that we're in, that everything is, is geared, all the marketing around us, so that we'll buy quickly, so that we'll buy without thinking. She considers, she thinks ahead of time. She ponders, what's the best way to use these resources? Is this the, the best stewardship of what God has given me? So she is uh, just consistently a steward. Uh, verse 27, she looks well to the ways of her household. 
I think really to summarize her stewardship. She is uh, like looking well, like a watchman uh, over her household, assessing what is the best way to care for this house. Not just the physical house, the household, the people, all the responsibilities, again, household responsibilities that she has, the people, the, the responsibilities, the daily activities that she has. And she looks well over all of those things. She's able to assess all of them, to say, what is the best way to use my time to, to steward these things that God has entrusted to me? So this is, this is her mindset uh, over and over again. She is a, a steward. She takes ownership of the things that she has. And, and you, you know the, the temptation. I think again about just the, the mindset of working hard. After you've worked hard, after you've had a long day, after you've done all of these, these things, especially if she's working with her hand, she's tired at night. You know, the temptation that creeps in is, is what about me? What about my time? You know, I did all this stuff, now I get something for me. And you just, you don't see this from this woman. You just see an others focused. The Lord has entrusted this to me and I get to serve him. I mean, this is what it looks like to be a, a servant of the king. You know, to joyfully take all of the responsibilities that he has given us. To say, how do, how do I now maximize my usefulness to him? How do I use all of these things that he has given me to be a, a steward, to be faithful to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I think as you, as you look at this list, I think it could be a little bit, maybe uh, hopefully encouraging in ways, but also there might be some things you say, man, I don't, I don't even know where to start. There's all these, different, all these different areas of life. I would just encourage you just to, just to assess. Maybe there's, there's one area. Is there one area to say, okay, there's a, there's a clear weakness. There are some, some things that I need to go after. Even to think about this week, you know, back to Ephesians 4.28, the, the putting off and putting on. What are the things that you need to put off? Are there, are there sin tendencies? Those are selfishness. Is there areas that you need to mortify in your own heart? And then how do you, you step just a, one of these at a time and say, how do I, Lord, could you help me in this one area this week? Strategically go after this. Prayerfully go after this. Ask someone to help me go after this. Maybe to ask, I mean, you could ask the question of, of somebody else, you know, wives to ask your husband, hey, what, what of these areas do you think I need to grow in? You know, and husbands be willing to step in and say, I'd love to help. Let's go after this together. And as you, as you read this, you know, these, these characteristics of her life, you, you get to the end of this section, you get to the, the summary of her life. And I love the, the summary here, verse 28 through 31. As you keep reading, uh, we started, I started this a couple weeks ago, just saying this is a, this is a life of fulfillment. This is a, a life that God is pleased with. You know, for us to actually, in our hearts, to believe this is what pleases the Lord. There is fulfillment and joy going after these things, this, this kind of lifestyle. And here you, you see a, a validation. You see the assessment of others. You know, at, at the end of her life, you see her, her children, her, her husband, and then finally in verse 30, the Lord, all assessing her life. Look what her, her children say. Her children rise up and bless her. Uh, the word bless, that is to just acknowledge God's favor upon her. To say she is living a, a faithful life in the sight of the Lord. They, they agree with God's assessment. This is a blessed life. They, they know the testimony of her life. The people, people closest to her, her family, the, the ones that see her every day, say, yes, she was faithful. Yes, she lived a life of integrity. She wasn't a different person in, in different situations. We, all we saw from her was faithfulness. And we have to remember these are, are Proverbs are truisms. You know, these are not promises. This is not to say that every child will rise up and say this. Not to say that, that children won't, won't rebel. And children won't even, even question, did you ever love me? But I, I just think about living in such a way living in such a way that we actually inform their conscience, moms that inform the consciences of their kids by the way that they live. So that if a child were to, to question, someday to question, did you ever love me? That they would have to do that against their own conscience because they, they would be so informed by the, the faithfulness of their mother to live that way, that, that their consciences are informed, that they know, they know that, that she, she only ever loved me and she loved the Lord and that's why she loved me. So her children rise up they, they agree with God's assessment. And her husband also, look what her husband says at the end of verse 28 and 29. He praises her saying, many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. 
you know, back to where we started, the, the heart of her husband trusts in her. Well, now he's really singing a song. You could, you know, theologically, a husband could say theologically, yes, this is the only woman for me. That's what, you know, that's what he's saying. You are the best woman that God has for me. Well, that's theologically true. But he's not just saying it theologically. He's, he's, his heart is singing this, you know, to say, Lord, thank you. You know, this is the, the woman that you gave me, and she has been such a blessing. Just think about all the, the love and support she has shown him to get to this point where he could look back on her life and just, and just praise the Lord and say, thank you for giving me this wife. A wife that's not critical, not suspicious, not nagging him, but is for him. And even for those in, in hard marriages, even women with unbelieving spouses, they can still model this, to be only ever for their husband, so that he, at the end of his life, would say, she was always for me. I'm so grateful that God gave her to me. And that pleases the Lord. That is a wife that is pleasing to the Lord, that has that kind of disposition, that kind of attitude toward her husband. And then we see the the Lord's assessment of her in verse 30. So you have her children's assessment, her husband's assessment, and then you have the the Lord's assessment, verse 30. But before that, you you have really back to the, think about the context of this verse. Uh, Proverbs 31.1 this, this is the, the words of King Lemuel, the oracle which his mother taught him. So a, a mother teaching her son, here's what to look for in a wife, an excellent wife who can find. So this is a mother saying, this is what to look for in a wife. And it's just thinking about, you know, a mother teaching her son this. Here's all these characteristics. Here's all, here's all these virtues. Here's the things that you should value. And you get to the end and you could just imagine the, the son at this point saying, okay, but what does she look like? You know, what does she look like? And, and her, his mom, again, you know, he's saying, you have the, the wrong lens. That must not be your first priority. You know, charm and beauty, those things are fleeting. Here's what you must look for. A woman who fears the Lord, you must look at her character. That is the, the most important part of her. That's what's going to last, is her character. Uh, charm, this is, uh, you could say, popularity. To be liked. You think about the, the funnest girl, the most exciting one, the most outgoing person. She has charm. She's likable. She's exciting to be with. And then beauty, obviously, physical attraction. You know, just think about just young men going after uh, a spouse, and what are the two things they're compelled for, compelled by? You know, is she pretty, and do I like being with her? Is she fun to be with? I mean, those are the things that they go after. And here, the the mother to the son is saying, don't go after these things. God is saying to us, don't go after these things as a first priority. Don't make those your top priority. What should you be most concerned about? You know, her heart before the Lord. All of this, these characteristics flow out of a heart that fears the Lord. Does she fear God? And if she fears God, this is what her life, the characteristic of her life will start to look like over time. This is what God will produce in a woman who fears the Lord. And our young women need to hear this too. You know, in a culture that that values all of the externals, a culture that that says to go after beauty and charm, to be popular and likable and to look good, and that's what people are going to value. That's what our culture promotes. You think about just social media. I mean, you're you're posting a, a picture on Instagram or whatever it might be, and then you delete that one, and then you take three more, and you delete those, and you take three more, because you want to find the perfect picture. Because I want to look a certain way. I want other people to approve of how I look. And just this temptation for, for young women, for, really for any woman, to, to say, I just want to be liked. I want other people to appreciate me and like me for my personality, for how I look. But here, this is God's assessment. A woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. To actually resolve in your heart that what I'm most committed to is pleasing the Lord. When it says she shall be praised, I think to say, not, not by, you know, her husband praises her, her children praise her, verse 31, her works praise her, other people see this, but here in verse 30, this is the Lord's assessment, the Lord looking at her and saying that, that I am pleased with this kind of life, I am pleased with this kind of character, this is a, this is a woman who is pleasing to me, you know, he is saying, well done, good and faithful servant, that, that is what pleases the Lord. And just to, just to remind us that if you are a follower of Christ, I mean, that is, that is our heart's desire, is to, is to please him, is to please Christ. 
you know, it can get, uh, that, that desire can be shrank by, just by worldliness, by the, the sins that we allow in our lives, by the distractions. But our, our heart's desire is to please him if you are in Christ. And here is what it looks like to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. Uh, for a godly woman to have this kind of character, this kind of virtue. In verse 31, you have a, <clears throat> really the, kind of the summary, uh, looking back on her life. I imagine verse 31 of like, just a, a woman in a rocking chair, you know, looking back over the course of her life, looking at a, just a job well done. It says, give her the product of her hands. Let her, let her enjoy the fruit of her labors. Let her look back on her life with, with satisfaction to say this wasn't wasted. This was a, a fulfilled life, a joy-filled life. This is a path to happiness and contentment. You know, going after these virtues, a, a life under the banner of fear of the Lord, under the watchful eye of, of the Lord. And it says, let her works praise her in the gates. Uh, Luke 7.35, Jesus says, wisdom will be known by her deeds. You know, that's the idea here, that, that she is validated by her, by her lifestyle. What, regardless of what other people say, regardless of what the world says is important, regardless of the, what the world says is most attractive, that at the end of her life, you can look back and say, wisdom will be known by her fruit. That her works, how she lived, will praise her. She'll have a trail of faithfulness. All these people that interacted with her, all her family, friends, the people that came into contact with her, will say she was faithful. This is a, a life well lived. And I just uh, imagine a, a church uh, us kind of the, to zoom back out and think about us in the church. Uh, just a a room full of women, a room full of moms, uh, young women, young men who are looking to be married. Just to think about what does it look like for a church to embrace these things together, to go after these things, to encourage one another for these things. You know, imagine how that would look to a watching world. You know, the church that's the pillar and support of the truth. As we embrace this truth, just to, to imagine the difference that that would create, to say, what is, what is going on at that church? Why are the women all joyful servants? Why do they all delight in their work? Why do they all love so well and are so generous? Why are they all so grateful and thankful? How are they so strong in the face of trials? You know, just to imagine a, a group of women in the church like that, and then, you, and then you could talk to the men. At this point, the men, either you're going to be indicted uh, or, or hopefully strengthened to say, I, I want to lead a woman like that. I want to encourage my wife toward that. I want to work harder to, to help her get there. I want to I teach my daughters to be those kind of women. I mean, that's what this passage should do for us, to give us a picture. This is God as a loving father saying, this is what I want for my children. This is what I want to produce in you and for us to, to go after those things, to say yes and amen, Lord. So let me, uh, let me pray for us that we would be a church that is marked by, by these kind of women. God, I just thank you for just the clarity of your word. I pray that we would just, with conviction, believe. It's easy to, to say words. It's easy to, to want to have uh, better circumstances, to enjoy our work, to enjoy our, our marriages more, Lord. But I pray that our desire would be to, to please you. I pray that our heart's desire Jesus would be to please you because you are the one who died for us, the one who reconciled us, the one who brought us into your family, the one who left the throne of heaven to, to bring lost people to yourselves. So I pray that we would live this week in light of that reality, and that we'd be fueled by a love for you, and that, that love for you would, would impact how we live tomorrow morning as we work, as we labor, as we go into jobs, in, in parenting, and all the things we have in front of us. We would do those as joyful servants of you, Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen. All right, well, you are dismissed until 1015. Thank you for being here.